So I have the honour, the privilege of being able to share the word with you this morning. So if you just want to go to the book of Revelation, just for a moment, the word that I have for you is very simple, it's very profound, very powerful, and very impacting. And very important. So Revelation chapter 3. I know you are well taught uh, and well instructed in the word in this church. In the, in the chapters of Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, seven churches, seven literal churches, seven existing churches are addressed in chapter 2 and chapter 3. And these are not, um, these, these, these churches are not allegories, they are real existing churches at the time. And so the last of those churches is in chapter 3 and verse coming in at verse 14. That's the, the seventh of the churches. And that's the church at Laodicea. So we'll just read these verses and I'll ask you a couple of questions about them. So chapter 3, coming in at verse 14, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. 17. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So those will be verses that you're very familiar with, but let me just ask you at, uh, at, at the start here, what, is there anything that stands out to you? you know, if you read those few verses, is there anything that stands out to you from those few verses? about this church or about this situation. Anything that stands out, as you read that, somebody, what's something that stands out to you from those verses? Somebody? Lukewarmness stood out to you? Okay, somebody else? I stand at the door and knock? Okay, somebody else? What stands out to you from those verses? Like, there's got to be something there that kind of like stands out to you about that situation or whoever overcomes? So the overcoming stands out. They say what they were saying, I'm rich. He who has an ear stands out to you. So he who has an ear, let him hear. Somebody else on this side, you're pretty quiet over here. Is that? To be clothed in white garments, somebody else? He'll come in and eat with you. Very good. Somebody else? What stands out to you about those few verses? I will vomit you out of my mouth. Okay, somebody's probably thinking, well, nothing stands out. Well, hopefully it will. Now, what stands out to me there, the couple of things I'll just point out to you because nobody's mentioned them, but one thing that stands out to me is this, that God does not see as man sees. That stands out to me. God does not see as man sees because they were saying one thing, about themselves, but God saw it differently. And the second thing that stands out to me is that God, and somebody mentioned this, is that God definitely doesn't like lukewarm. Can I have an amen? Now, with God, lukewarm is not the flavour of the month. Are you okay with my accent there? Lukewarm is not the flavour of the month. Okay. Now, here's, a, here's another question. Um, how do you think they might have got like this. How did they get like this? How did they get in this state? Huh? Gradually? Okay, very good. How did they get this way? 
We'd all agree, right, they're not in good shape. Are we okay? We'd all agree with that? Talk to me, somebody. Amen? Don't be quiet. Talk to me. I don't have to come out and take your pulse to see if you're here or not. We'd all agree that they're not in good shape. So how did they get this way? They got comfortable, uh, complacent. They didn't persevere. Tradition. Uh, okay, became prosperous. All right, excellent. Now, we started with that. We're going to finish with that, but not right now, okay? I've got some stuff in the middle. That's the beginning. We'll come back to the ending a little bit. Go to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. So that's Mark's Gospel and chapter 3. I want to work with a couple of words here from this um, text in Mark chapter 3. So this is early in Mark's Gospel and Mark um, was the first of the Gospel accounts that were written. So if we just come down to um, verse 13 of chapter 3. And it says that he, talking about Jesus, went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. And then it, it names, it by name, it tells you who those twelve were. So we've come to know them as the, at the time as the twelve apostles, the twelve disciples that were called to the apostolic role there. So he called to him those he wanted and he appointed twelve that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. Now, us humans, we always gravitate towards or we always seem to highlight, I get to preach. I get to pray for the sick folks. That sounds like me. I get to cast out demons. We always gravitate towards what we get to do. But if you look there, the first thing that Jesus called them to do was to be with him. And sometimes we miss that. And so really from that platform or from that foundation of being with him, good morning, from that platform of being with him, then they get sent out to preach, pray for the sick folk, deal with the demonic, etc. But sometimes we pass right over that with him. A couple of other translations, um, Amplified has the word continue added in there, that they might continue with him. Right? And um, Dr. Woost, from his translation and his um, commentary on Greek words on the New Testament, he says that the verb denotes continuing action. And he translates it that they might constantly be with him. Because that verb there is continuing action, that they might constantly, Amplified uses the word continually, be with him. Are we okay? With him. Now, I look through different um, study Bibles that I've got access to. I look through different commentaries. And a lot of the newer stuff just passes right over those two words, with him. But I did find a couple of comments. So Matthew Henry, now um, his Bible commentary, you're going back centuries to Matthew Henry. He was late 1600s and early 1700s. And I quote, this is what Matthew Henry said, quote, Note, Christ's ministers must be much with him. Isn't that good? Matthew Henry, Christ's ministers must be much with him. Now a lady in, the, in our church family who's much more computer literate than I am, she looked up some stuff and she gave me this. And this is from a commentary I'd never heard of, Mercer's commentary on the New Testament. I'd never heard of them. Um, but no, from um, Mercer University Press from Georgia. So it's the Baptist people. And this is the comment they had on that. It said, in the ancient world, it was thought that a disciple could not 
properly carry out the instructions of the teacher without first spending a great deal of time in the teacher's presence. Isn't that good? It was thought that a disciple, right, hmm? couldn't properly carry out the instructions of the teacher without first spending a great deal of time in the teacher's presence. The Gospel of Mark applies this insight to Christian formation. I thought it was really good, really good. Right now, Acts chapter 4, let's just have a look at another example here. So we're talking about with him. Acts chapter 4. He called them, first of all, to be with him. Acts chapter 4. And in verse 13, so this is the following chapter from the man at the gate, beautiful, being healed when Peter and John were going up at the hour of prayer to the temple. This is the following, this is the aftermath, the um, slipstream of that. But chapter 4 and verse 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. But they noticed something. See, they marvel and they realized that they had been. Where? Where? Everybody, are you here this morning? Where'd they been? With Jesus. How many of you are parents? You have children. You've had children. You have children. You're parents. You're a mum, you're a dad, you're parents. Okay? Uh, we have four. Right, we have four, so our, our youngest will be 27 this year. Our oldest will be um, 38 this year. So we have four children, so we've, we've, we have done and are doing the dad and mum thing. Now, how many of you parents know? Okay? You could tell. You know. You knew who your children had been with. Come on, put your hand up. You could tell who they'd been with. Amen? Put your hand up. You knew. They come home, they've been out somewhere, they've been out on a whatever, they've been out staying with somebody, been out someplace, whatever. But when they come back into your presence, you could tell who they'd been with. Now that's either positive, can I have an amen, or negative, but you could tell who they'd been with. Amen? So they could tell these, these here in Acts 4 that the scripture I showed you had been with Jesus. Now how many of you um, can remember the father of modern day men's ministry? Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole. Who can remember Dr. Cole? Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole. Okay, he's from your country here. Um, now, who, who, who's heard of Christian Men's Network? Anybody? Okay. Now, his book that really kind of put him on the map was called Maximize Manhood. Anybody heard of that? Maximize Manhood. Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole. All right, so he's the father or the founding figure of the um, modern day men's movement. He was like a, kind of like a John the Baptist, if you like, a forerunner. Promise Keepers came out of, um, um, they had connections with Dr. Cole. So I think that um, Dr. Cole went to heaven, I think it was 2003, the same time as Brother Hagen. I think the same year from memory. Surely I got to know Dr. Cole, but let me just tell you the story what happened. So back in the, in the late 1980s when Christian Men's Network was started, we had a connection with a um, Bible training centre in uh, Dallas Fort Worth and they sent us the videos the old videotapes they sent us the videos of Dr. Cole ministering there in this Bible school uh, and he did a like a seminar on maximized manhood so I went on for about I think it was like four or five sessions and they sent us the videos from that so I got to sit down and watch for the first time Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole maximize manhood and it was great it was fantastic he was a great guy. Now what happened then was Christian Men's Network came to New Zealand. We got our church to be part of it. Okay, So we joined up with it and we get a, a, a video every month from Dr. Cole. Every month we get a new video as part of Christian Men's Network. Then I got to see his books. I got to read his books. Maximize Manhood, Courage, the book Courage. Courage, um, he printed Courage with a... Um, military camouflage cover and all of your soldiers 
from the US that took part in Desert Storm got a copy of Dr. Cole's book, Courage. All of you soldiers in Desert Storm got a copy of that book. So I got to see his books, uh, the, the book um, Sexual Integrity. I got to see his books, got to be able to read his books. Then what happened was, because we're part of Christian Men's Network, Dr. Cole actually came to our country. He came to our country. And he did some men's meetings in our country. And he actually came to our city and did a men's meeting in our city. So I got to go from the videos, I got to go from that to the books and then to the meetings. And when Dr. Cole came to New Zealand, I would fly to every, wherever the meeting was and be part of that meeting. Now, the last time he came to New Zealand, they called me and asked me, would you like to be part of the team that travels with Dr. Cole? So now I've gone from the videos to the books to the meetings. Now I get to travel and be with Dr. Cole. And uh, 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 shortening the story, he became a spiritual father to me. And I got to, uh, in New Zealand, we went into three different cities. He would ask us up before the meeting to kneel around his bed in his hotel room and pray with him before the meeting. Then in the year 2000, he, he used to do the meetings here in the US called Lion's Roar. And a whole bunch of guys would turn up. But in, in the year 2000, he did something called the Heart of the Lion. The Heart of the Lion. And you had to have a personal invitation to go to that. And he called me up and said, Colin, I'm inviting you. Come be with me in Dallas-Fort Worth. Come be part of the Heart of the Lion. So on the Sunday we went to the church that his son Paul had just started and then he invited us home for lunch. So I got to be with Dr. Cole in his house, just a few of us. Very precious memories. Now why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that for this reason. Praise God for the videos. Praise God for the books. Praise God for being able to be in the meetings. But I want to tell you, my brother, my sister, I got something that you can't get just from a video or just from a book or just from a meeting. I got something by virtue of being able to be with the Do you understand what I'm saying? I got something by virtue of being able to be with Dr. Cole that you couldn't get from a book, praise God for books, that you couldn't get from a video, praise God for that, that you couldn't get from a meeting. I got, to, I got to get something from Dr. Cole because I was able to be, finish the sentence, I was able to be with him. Other than immediate family, I've had two men, men, kiss me. One of them's an old bishop from Australia, and the other was the last time we were together, and Dr. Cole kissed me. Now, one of the greatest, um, how can I put this, one of the greatest compliments that I've ever been paid in ministry. Now, people say stuff all the time. Now, words are cheap and very often shallow. But one of the greatest compliments I personally have ever been paid in ministry, and this is our 35th year of ministry, is in 2010, 2010, and it was in Dallas-Fort Worth at ICFM convention. And that was the first opportunity I got to do a workshop was in 2010. Okay. So I got to do a workshop. And after my workshop at ICFM, a pastor was waiting to see me. I, I, I'm from New Zealand. I've never met this man before. Uh, we're, we're complete strangers. But he's waiting to talk with me. And this is what he said to me. He, said, uh, he asked me, what's your schedule? I told him, he said, I want you to come and preach in my church. He said, I will organise whatever it takes to get you there. Wednesday night service, we could do that. And this is what he said to me. I'm like, I'm like really amazed. Like I'm a stranger. You want me to come and preach in your church? And this is what he said to me. He said, I can tell that you have been with Dr. Cole. And that's seven years after Dr. Cole's death. So I want you to come and preach in my church. I'll organise it. He said, I can tell that you have been with Dr. Cole. That's one of the greatest compliments that I have ever been paid in ministry. 
See, a lot of people say stuff, a lot of people claim stuff. When Dr. Cole was um, like riding the wave of international success, quote unquote, he told us, he said, many people say that I'm their spiritual father. But he said, they just use my name for their publicity. DNA is the proof of paternity. Can I have an amen? And you can only imbibe DNA and you get that by being with somebody. Is that a good example? So what am I saying? Praise God for Christian television. Praise God for books. Praise God. We, we do it all. Praise God for them. But there's some things that you can only imbibe by being with him. Amen? How is your with him? That's what I'm here for this morning, to ask you, how is your with him? Let me show you what to me is an amazing example in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Show you this, it's an amazing example to me. Mark chapter 1. And this is the calling of Peter and Andrew and James and John in Mark chapter 1. I find this amazing. So Mark 1 and verse 16. As he, Jesus, walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me. Right, pause, pause, push the pause button. What were the first two words that they heard? Follow me. So according to Mark's account now, here's a stranger walking around the shore. They are fishing, casting their nets into the sea. And the stranger speaks to them, and the first words they hear is, follow me. Okay. Now, they did that. They left their nets, it says that there, and they followed him. So that following went on for about three and a half years. So that's like three and a half years compacted ministry training school. Are we okay? Following my accent all right? About three and a half years ministry training school. Now, three and a half years later, the senior staff. They're the best Jesus has got. He's going to be leaving soon, he knows that, and so the future of the church is going to be left in their hands. Can I have an amen? Because he's leaving. Sure, he's going to send the Holy Spirit, but he's leaving, and so these 12, minus Judas, now 11, they get, the church is going to be left in their hands. So they are senior staff. They're the best he's got. Three and a half years with Jesus. They've been preaching, they've been casting out demons, they've been praying for the sick themselves. So they're, they're experienced now, the senior staff. All right. Go to the last chapter of the book of John. The last chapter of the book of John. Last chapter of the book of John. Which is John chapter 21. And this is where Peter said at the beginning of the chapter, I'm going back fishing. You do a little word study on that. Uh, here's, from, here's verse 3 from Woost. Simon Peter says to them, I'm going off breaking my former connections to my former fishing business. I'm going back. Of course, Jesus comes, stands on the shore. He asks Peter those uh, three times, do you love me? Remember that? Do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Okay, now, come down to um, verse uh, 19. So for 18, he tells Peter how he's going to die. But come down to verse 19. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Woost translation, be following with me. So verse 19, he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. When he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me, or Woos translation, be following with me. 20, Peter turning around saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus. 
But Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You. Everybody, you follow me. What's the first words to Jesus, of Jesus to Peter? What's the last word? Be following with me. So here you've got three and a half years senior ministry, experienced a whole lot of things, the best Jesus has got, and the instructions are the same. I don't know about you, but I find that amazing. I find that amazing. I mean, so many people, oh, oh, Pastor Colin, I want a fresh word from the Lord. Have you got a fresh prophecy for me? I don't want something that's stale. Listen, the word of God is never stale. That's a joke. The word of God is never stale. I want a fresh word. Listen, it's not the word that's stale, it's you. The word of God is never old, mouldy bread. It's people that get old and mouldy. Can I have a better amen? So three and a half years of ministry, what's the first words? Follow me. What's the last words? Follow me. Nothing's changed. But so many people today, well, I need a fresh word. I need this. I need that. Follow me. Now, um, you know, of course, Pastor Chris and Jill Twin. Chris and Jill Twin. Yeah, you know who I'm talking about. But he told us that, um, you would have probably heard this before, but he told us that there was a saying, may you be covered with the dust of your rabbi. Chris Twin told us that. Now, he's, he's half Jewish, as you know, you've met him. So he told us that there was a saying with rabbis and disciples, may you be covered with the dust of your rabbi. And that was considered to be an honour. And so he gave us the picture there that they were walking everywhere, as I'm sure as you know, and their roads were not uh, laid out in concrete or asphalt. Okay, so dirt, dust. Now, may you be covered by the dust of your rabbi. You would be the disciple that is following closest to the rabbi. So as he walked, you were walking right there and the dust that he kicked up would cover you. That was considered to be a place of honour or a thing of honour. May you be covered with the dust of your rabbi. So isn't that what Jesus is saying there? The last words, follow me. Stick close to me. Stay with me. Are we all right? How is your with him? Hmm. You know, in today's world, I was just touched on this briefly up at, up at ICFM, that um, we live in the fast lane. People live in the fast lane. You've got to live in the fast lane. We say in New Zealand, foot to the floor. I think you say pedal to the metal. I think that's what you say here. We say foot to the floor, pedal to the metal. All the cool people live in the fast lane. You've got to live in the fast lane. It's great having um, you know, these flash phones, um, smartphones and all these other flash things because you can have your Bible on you, see? And you can sit in church here and you just look up the Bible reference, you take notes on them too. But at the same time, everybody in here thinks you're taking notes, but you can actually text back, you can look at Facebook at the same time. All these things help you live faster. You don't have to wait till church is finished, you can actually look at Facebook now while I'm preaching. You can actually text and do emails now while I'm preaching. The folks around you think that you're on the Bible, but you're not. You're living faster. You're living faster. You're doing correspondence. You're doing business, replying to emails. You're looking at Facebook here in church, but the folks around you think you're doing looking up Woost or looking up the Amplified, but you're not. You can live faster. I don't do any social media. You probably guessed it. And what's the one? Is it, is it Twitter that's limited to 140 characters? Twitter, I think, 140 characters. Here's the problem. We want to do God like that. God, I've got time to send you a quick 140 characters because I'm in a hurry. This cell phone, 
is not with him. That's not with him. Are you listening to me? That's not with him time. And doing your messages while you're in here either is dishonoring the word of God. I sit behind people in meetings all the time. People were doing this up in um, convention. I was watching them up in ICFM, just up in Branson, Facebook, sending messages while a man or woman of God preaching the word. Why? Because we're in the fast lane. We've got to live faster. I promise you, you cannot love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and all your strength from the fast lane. You can't do it. Hmm. You know, some people are just hard to be with. You might have some relatives like that. They're just hard to be with. You, know, you, you, you drop in and visit them and you, you realise, I've worn out my welcome in five minutes. They're hard to be with. Well, some people find God hard to be with. I hope it's not you. Now, let me tell you another little story from my files. Um, 1986 was actually the end of 1985 when we started our first church, end of 1985. And some people found out we're going to do a Bible school. We're planning on another year before we do a Bible school. And these people just turned up. I mean, ex-hippies and different folks turned up and said, where's this Bible school? So we started our Bible school in May 86. And uh, a lot of the curriculum I personally wrote. So we were able to get some uh, access to some videos from, again, from Dallas-Fort Worth. But the rest of the curriculum I personally wrote in longhand before laptop days, this is 1986, in longhand, I still have all of those notes, 26 lessons on the Holy Spirit and his gifts on pieces of paper, all in longhand. I kept them all. But here's the thing, sometimes I'm like, a, 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 and we talk about five days a week, so sometimes I'm like the day ahead in the morning, I'm up early and I'm doing notes, and I'm surrounded by, I've got Strong's, I've got Young's, I've got Vines here, I've got other commentaries, books, stuff, and I'm writing a curriculum. So we do the first year, and then a bunch of people say, when's the second? We want to do the second year. So I've been doing this like for 15 months or 18 months. I'm up early in the morning, uh, I've got these, these, these concordances around me, study Bibles around me, and I'm studying, I'm writing these curriculum notes. We're, we're, we're a lecture ahead. We're a day ahead. And it just goes on like this week after week after week. So I'm under pressure, right, and writing these notes. And so I'm sitting there one morning, this has been going like 15, 18 months, I'm sitting there one morning getting ready for the day, writing up the lecture notes for the day. And all of a sudden, there's like this, um, I, I, it's hard to describe, it's like this holy quietness comes into my office. So I'd be last to bed in my house at night, studying, writing notes, curriculum notes. First up in the morning, again, doing notes, curriculum notes. And then this morning I get interrupted. And it's like this holy presence comes into my study. And I'm like stilled. I've got nothing to say. I know, who's, I know, I know what this is about, but I've got nothing to say. And it's like the Lord spoke to me, just four simple words. But those four simple words gave me a spanking. What were the words? Son, what about us? You get that? I'm surrounded by Bibles, surrounded by translations. I'm not out there running wild, sinning, parties, drunk chasing women, I'm surrounded by Bibles, I'm preparing course curriculum notes and God rudely interrupts me and asks me, son, what about us? You understand that? What had happened? My with him time. had been swallowed up by preparation for this Bible school for folk, but I'd let my with him time, which comes first, I'd let that slip. 
Are you here? That was a spanking. I had to deal with that. Mm. I didn't appreciate it at the time. I've got, I've got notes to write. I've got curriculum. I've got students waiting for lectures. Now, with him, really does take care of everything else. You, 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 you deal with people, you get disappointed, you get discouraged. These things are normal to life. We know from Corinthians that nothing happens to us that's not common to man. Test, trials, temptation. So we deal with busy schedules, we deal with all kinds of things. But you know, this with him really takes care of everything. If you're discouraged, you've been disappointed, with him makes all the difference in the world. You, know, you need some counsel, you need some wisdom on something, with him makes all the difference in the world. You struggle to walk with people, listen, if you walk with him, you can walk with the folks. Isn't that right? You walk with him, you can walk with the folks. So this whole with him thing really does take care of everything else. Anxieties, concerns, stress, blah, 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 the list. But the with him changes everything. Isn't that right? Remember, just, just a quick Bible example. Remember David? And uh, he was living as a Philistine vassal and they'd given him Ziklag. Philistine lords had given him Ziklag, and him and his men were living in Ziklag. He marched out to war. The other Philistine lords said, we don't want him, part of this battle, he could turn on us. They march back. They get back three days out, three days back, and Ziklag has been burned with fire. Everything gone. They've taken the cash flow machines, they've taken everything. All the animals, all the livestock, everybody. And everybody cried and wept until they had no more power to weep. And then the men spoke of stoning David. That's a bad day in church. Isn't that right? At the end of the day, they would, let's just stone the pastor. That's the best answer we can come up with. That's a bad day. What did David do? He went to the Lord. Spent some time with him and encouraged himself in the Lord's presence saw everything differently, and went won, and won a great victory. Can you say amen? amen? See, with him changes everything. But we're in such a... We've got to, we've got to stay in the fast lane, right? Because all the cool people live in the fast lane. Now, I, was, I, was, I was seven hours on the ground in Houston waiting for my connecting flight, and I'm sitting at a table as a lady across from me, a young woman, and she's working two cell phones. She's so important, she's working two cell phones. Right? Then I was telling somebody about that, and they said, well, I know somebody, they, they work two cell phones plus an iPad plus a laptop. My conclusion, they must be helping God run the world, right? They're so important, they must be helping God run the world. And so we get so caught up in the fast lane, and you know what? We medicate. When I say that, people think I say meditate. No, 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 not meditate. Medicine. We medicate. Medicine. So we can stay in the fast lane. Pop vitamin pills so we can stay in the fast lane. All the cool people are in the fast lane. And what happens is we let out with him time. And we're the poorer for it. Are we all right? Am I doing okay? Where's Phil? Am I doing okay, Phil? Yeah. Thumbs up from you, brother. I'm doing all right. Hallelujah. So let's just go back to Revelation chapter 3. We started with this. We're going to finish with this. Revelation chapter 3. So we read these verses about the church in Laodicea as we started. 
So I want to show you this. So coming in at 15, where God said, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's God's readout, God's, how God saw it. But they saw it very differently. Verse 17, I am rich, have become wealthy, have needed nothing. Do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, verse 20. Verse 20. Let me just say this about verse 20. I have been in meetings, and, and I'm okay with this, I've been in meetings where the evangelist has been ministering. And they use this verse, and they say, now, you're out here, and you're unsaved. Jesus is standing, knocking at the door of your heart tonight. He's wanting you to open the door and come in. I've been in meetings live where that's happened. I've seen meetings on DVD where that's happened. I've seen that in literature where that is. So Revelation 3.20 says, now, if you don't know the Lord, if you're, if you're, if you're uh, an unbeliever here tonight, Jesus is standing knocking on the door of your heart. Why don't you open the door and let him in? Okay, first correction. Who are these verses to? The church of Laodicea. Not to the local bar. Not to the local uh, synods club. Not to the local sports club. These verses are to believers. These verses are to Christians who once were hot, but now are lukewarm. First correction. Now, if you use that as evangelist, that would be a secondary application of the scripture. But this is primarily to the church. Right? Now, here's a question for you. I want to know, what's he doing outside? What's he doing outside, my brother, my sister? Doesn't the church belong to him? Didn't he purchase this with his blood? Doesn't, isn't he the Lord and head? Isn't it his church? Well, why is he outside? I promise you, when you get home from this meeting, drive up to your door, and you arrive at your house, you're not going to come up to your front door, at the front door of your house, and... The neighbours see you doing that, they'll think you're crazy. What? It's your house. You just go up and you open the door and walk in because it's your house. Why is Jesus outside and why does he even have to knock? Think about it. How do you get that way? Well, it's in verse 20. Hmm? Let's read it again. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine. And dine. I will come in and dine with him and he with me. How do you get that way? You turn away and you walk away from your with him time. We okay? And you can see that's exactly what they've done here, verse 20. I stand at the door and knock, church. If anyone hears my voice and opens a door, I will come into him and dine with him. The with him time. And he will dine. Can you see that? With him. So how do you get lukewarm? How do you get in this state? You let your with him time sort. Isn't that good revelation? With him. And so this church in Laodicea had got busy, had got prosperous, had got complacent, some of those things you were talking about. But what had happened is that their with him time had been kind of, what do we say, put on the back burner, I think we say, is that a term here, back burner? We kind of let our with him time slip. So my brother, my sister, if you don't look after you, you're with him time. You've got to get out of the fast lane to look after your with him time. 
He's got that life. But if you don't look after your with him time, lukewarmness is coming to your house. I promise you. It is coming to your house. It is coming to your life because you let your with him time slip. We have other interests. We have other desires, other lovers, other lovers that get our time. Are we all right? So my message today, this morning, very simple. It's very powerful. It's very profound. It can be very impacted. And nothing is really more important than this. How is my with him time? You reflect, just like your children do when they come back to you, you reflect the company you've been in. Hmm? Now, I'm not your pastor. You have a good pastor here, but I do have people that I pastor. And I can tell, this will make you nervous, I can tell when my guys have been looking at pornography, I can tell. I can tell. Now, I'm not saying your pastor can, so just relax. But if my guys have been looking at pornography, I can tell. Because it shows who you've been with. Are we okay? You're just asking, you better sign off right now, Pastor Colin. That's far enough. I don't want to go any further. Okay. But you can tell because you reflect the company that you've been in and who you've been with. Amen. Okay, so that's my word this morning. Praise God. I'll call up your pastor. Hallelujah. How is your with him time? That's my question. And nothing is more important than this. It's more important for me in ministry. At the moment, we're pastoring two churches 170k apart. Two different cities. Kilometre. Okay, a K is a kilometre. So two different churches 170 kilometres apart. So I could, I could stack up some excuses for being busy, but nothing is more important. Nothing is more important than my with him time. Amen? Okay, God bless you.